There are a lot of great things that we could say uh, about Stranger in the Shogun City. I'm going to let uh, Amy say most of those. Uh, but she is a professor of history at Northwestern University. Um, Amy Stanley is primarily a social historian of early modern and modern Japan. Uh, she has special interests in global history, women's and gender history, and narrative history. Uh, she is the author in 2012 of Selling Women, Prostitution Markets in the Household in Early Modern Japan, and has articles in a wide range of journals, including the American Historical Review, the Journal of Japanese Studies, and the Journal of Asian Studies. Um, her book, Stranger in the Shogun City, A Japanese Woman in Her World, published in 2020, won the National Book Critics Circle Award in Biography, uh, and the Pan America Jacqueline Bograd Weld Award in Biography, and was also a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. She received her PhD in East Asian Languages and Civilizations from Harvard University in 2007. And she has held fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the Japan Foundation, the Japan-U.S. Japan Friendship Commission, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, before inviting her up, <coughs> I will just read uh, a couple of paragraphs from the epilogue of Stranger in the Shogun City in case you have not yet had a chance to read it, where Professor Stanley is trying to think a little bit about the story that she told uh, and um, the way in which it might matter today. She reflects in the epilogue upon visiting Tokyo uh, with her son. She says, but after following Tsuneno's life for nearly a decade, uh, I could also see the barest outlines of a different Tokyo, an older city, the one she knew, where the skyscrapers were rickety fire towers, and the sound of traffic was the clomping of wooden clogs on dirt, where the grounds of the Imperial Palace were the precincts of Edo Castle. Somewhere among the glass and steel towers in Shinjuku, Tsuteno and Hirosuke had tried to run a restaurant near the monuments of Ueno Park. She knelt by her younger brother's deathbed, and she said goodbye. A short walk from the grand department stores and luxury boutiques in Ginza, she passed through the long hallways of the South Magistrate's office. Most of the physical landscape of Tsuneno City is gone, leveled by earthquakes, fires, and firebombs. There are a few exceptions. One of the red gates to the Lord of Kaga's mansion, which Tsuneno might have passed on her way into the city, still stands at the entrance of the main campus of Tokyo University. And the Fujimi Watchtower of Edo Castle still looks out over the city from its base of heavy gray stones. But most of Edo dwells in the realm of collective memory. It lives under glass, at museums, and in a corner of every bookstore, in the shopping arcades, of working class neighborhoods and in the kitchens of old restaurants devoted to eel or noodles. One of the newest Tokyo subway lines is still called the Great Edo Line, which seems fitting. The old city still runs just beneath the surface of the new one, moving to its own subterranean rhythm. But you have to know where it is, how to feel its presence. Um, as I read this book, I was um, moved in a, a couple of important ways. Uh, one way that I was moved is uh, that I wanted somehow to be able to tell the story of an ordinary person um, in a way that was as captivating as we see uh, Professor Stanley do in this book. And I came to believe that an ordinary life that may not make it into uh, most history books is a deeply meaningful life. It made me want to think a little bit more about my own story and the way I write about my story and the narrative that I tell as I try to live my ordinary life. And I invite you as we listen today to think about uh, the ways in which you might try to think about memory and the way it affects you, um, the way in which you are documenting your experiences and the stories that someone might tell about your life. Please wel uh, welcome Amy Stanley.
Thank you all so much for being here today. And thank you, Quinn, for that amazing introduction. Um, I am so thrilled that my book was chosen as a book of the semester. Um, and I have such a um, kind of amazing audience to talk to about how I wrote this book. Basically, the title of the lecture is From the Archive to the Page, because I'm going to take you through, you know, how it is that I took the evidence that I encountered in the archive, both visual res evidence and written evidence, and then formed it into something that looks like a story. Um, so, as you know, I'm a historian of early modern Japan, primarily, and that's the period between 1600 and 1868. And I've always been interested in ordinary women and also everyday life. And even though women's history and social history and gender history are all well-established fields by now, it can still be a very challenging area of research because you're kind of caught between the fear that you won't find anything and the fear that even if you do, no one will care. So it's been long the conventional wisdom in my field that there is no audience uh, for a popular book about Japanese history that doesn't somehow feature white men or World War II, or if you're really lucky, both of them at once. Um, and in fact, when I told the former Consul General of Japan in Chicago that I was writing a book about an unknown Japanese woman from the early 19th century, he said to me, who will want to read that? <laughs> So luckily, I think that people did read the book um, I eventually produced, which is called Stranger in the Shogun City, which many of you have read. Um, but in order to do that, I really had to think hard about how to create a narrative that would be compelling. And this was extremely difficult precisely because of the inevitable gaps in the record. So no one can ever find a complete archive. There is no such thing. And as the historians here all know, you will never ever learn everything you want to know about the past, which is in some ways what is fun about writing history. Um, but all that said, some subjects are much more difficult than others. So if you're writing a biography of Thomas Jefferson or some other famous man, you will probably find that he wrote so much and other people wrote so much about him that you have enough material to illuminate his character and his motivations. With people who did not leave an extensive documentary record, including most ordinary people, including most women, you have to do a lot more as a writer to compensate. So I faced this problem when I wrote this book about a Japanese woman named Tsuneno, a totally obscure person who, like many women of her time and place, only left traces in the record when she was causing trouble. Luckily for me, she was often causing trouble, but not always. Um, and that left huge spans of time that went completely unaccounted for, so including her entire childhood and the period of her first marriage. And even more difficult, uh, like most early modern people, she did not write in what we would call a confessional mode. Um, even when I could figure out what it was she did, I couldn't necessarily figure out how she felt or I couldn't understand exactly why she did it. Um, and without that element of motivation, because this was not a person who was constantly talking about all her feelings, it was difficult to assemble a narrative that made sense. So sometimes I had to turn to world building in the hope that by kind of creating a picture of the world around Tsuneno, I could create an outline of the person who is occupying the center. And to do that, I figured out that it was really going to be important to build out the sensory world of late Edo period Japan as much as possible. So what things looked like, what they smelled like, what they tasted like, what they felt like. Um, and to do that, I often turned to visual evidence that surrounded Tsunero and her family when I had no documentary evidence that came directly from them. And the other strategy I used was to make creative use of the sources that I did have in Tsuneno's voice, in the voices of her correspondents, thinking not only about the content of the words on the page, which of course is very important, but also the form, so what they looked like, how they were composed. So this talk then, it's about Tsuneno and her world in early modern Japan, but it's also about what historians would call methodology, that is, how you assemble a story from scraps of context, and what happens when that strategy inevitably fails, because it will, uh, because there are many things that you simply do not know. So to borrow a metaphor from Tsuneno's work with textiles, because she was an accomplished seamstress, I tried to write this book so that the seams didn't show. 
um, so that you couldn't see that it's essentially made out of patchwork. But in this talk, I'm going to try to turn the narrative inside out to give you a, a glimpse of all the messiness underneath it. So um, to give you the background of this story, I first met Sinino in 2009 when I was starting out as an assistant professor at Northwestern. And for the first time, I was assigned to deliver a lecture course to undergraduates about Japan in the Edo period. And I was really excited because this is the area of my specialty. But as I was looking around for course material for the syllabus, I realized there was not much to assign about everyday life in farming villages that was accessible to students who would read only in English. There's more now, but 10 years ago, things were different. So I was looking around for material that I could translate and assign to my students, and I ended up on the homepage of the Niigata Prefectural Archives. Um, and the Niigata Prefectural Archives is a public archive uh, Japanese prefectures are kind of like states. Niigata is on the Sea of Japan. So this is like the state's public archive. Part of their mission is to introduce their materials to the reading public um, so that people can understand their own history and the local history of Niigata. And so in order to do this, they have something on their website called the Internet Document Reading Course. Um, and through the Internet Document Reading course, they, uh, they um, introduced some of the materials from their collection, and they would tell you what was in them, basically. They offer a transcription, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, and also kind of indicate how this one document fits into the other documents that they have in the archive. So number 13 in the Internet Document Reading course uh, caught my attention, and this is what it looks like. And at the time, when I first encountered this in 2009, I couldn't read it at all. Um, but luckily, they did produce a transcription because actually ordinary people who read Japanese, who are Japanese, can't read this either without a transcription into characters that look more like modern characters. Um, and from the transcription that they had on the website, I produced a translation, which looks like this. Um, this is a letter from someone named Tsuneno to her mother, someplace called Zinsenji. And the letter begins, I'm writing with spring greetings. As you know, I went to Kanda Minagawa Cho in Edo quite unexpectedly, and I ended up in so much trouble. And then this letter goes on in a style that's shockingly vivid and almost contemporary. Um, she brags about her boss, a wealthy merchant who's building a villa for his concubine. She recommends a certain kind of hair oil that she bought for her sister-in-law, Sano. And she writes that everything I eat is delicious. The food here is great. Um, and this actually is what grabbed me because it sounded so much like me writing emails home from Tokyo in 1997. Um, this is one of the first things, if you go to Tokyo, that you will notice, which is that all of the food is incredibly delicious. So even before I knew the rest of this woman's story, I fell in love with that voice in the letters. In the document reading course, the internet, uh, the archive provided a brief synopsis of Tsunino's life. It said that she had been divorced and run away from her village, and that ultimately she ended up in the service of a famous Edo city magistrate. And it also said, and there are dozens of letters by her in our collection. So I visited the archive as soon as I could, and I spent days there taking pictures of hundreds and hundreds of pages. Um, Edo period letters are fo folded accordion style. Um, when you unfold them, they can take up the entire width of an archive reading room's table. So these were very long documents, kind of literally. And it turned out that Tsunino's letters, as long as they were, were not the only documents that were relevant. Um, there were letters also from other correspondents who wrote to Tsunino or to the family about Tsunino, and this is what they look like. Um, there were also um, draft letters, which was really important. Because if you think about correspondence, we don't think about correspondence this way anymore because we have email. And if you have email and you're doing your correspondence that way, you have a record of all the emails you've sent in your sent mail folder, which is really useful. If you are thinking about letters and archives, usually when you find an archive, you only find the letters that the people received. You do not find the letters that they sent because those letters are gone elsewhere. And so you usually in an archive only have one half of the correspondence. 
But actually, this family kept drafts of some of their outgoing correspondence, which you can see here. And they look scribbled and drafty. And in fact, this one was composed on the back of some sketches of samurai, which you can kind of see there on the left. So this is scrap paper. But this is good because it meant that I had two sides of the correspondence often. Um, and then also, there were envelopes. This is how Edo period envelopes looked. Um, people didn't buy envelopes at the store and use a stamp. They folded up paper to use as an envelope and then tucked the accordion folded letter inside. And envelopes are really important because they have addresses on them. And that's how you know where people were when these letters were going back and forth. There are also household diaries and records of expenses. And there were inventories and shopping lists, so lists of the things that the household had in their possession. The problem was that back in 2009, I couldn't read a single thing. Um, I had no idea what these documents said. I didn't even have any idea what they might be saying. Everything just looked like squiggles to me, as I'm sure they look like squiggles to many of you. So I thought that I was wasting my time and, more importantly, my research funding. But I'd gone all the way there, so I just stood in the Niigata Prefectural Archive, taking photo after photo, feeling kind of hopeless about the whole thing. Why am I here taking pictures of something I'm never going to be able to read? But I eventually did learn to read these documents um, with the help of my manuscript dictionary, which I utterly destroyed in the process of looking up these characters. You can see there my dog next to the manuscript dictionary. Um, and I'm telling you this story partly as background, how I came to the substance of the book that I eventually wrote, but also as an illustration of the materiality of the sources I used. And also, the thing is that when you encounter something um, that you feel like you are never going to be able to do. Um, it's good to kind of be modest about what you think you can accomplish and not kind of go off in, in crazy directions, trying to do something that's impossible. But also, there are ways to learn how to read things that you did not know already how to read. One of them is just through destroying your character dictionary. Um, but also, I had a lot of help from people in Japan who were skilled at reading these kinds of manuscripts. So I gave some of these letters to a friend of mine. He helped me figure out what the first one said. And from that, I was able to learn. So the lesson there is to accept help and also to seek it out. Um, so from these sources, I could assemble an outline of a story that Sinino was a Buddhist priest's daughter, that she was born in 1804 in Echigo province in Ishigami village, which you can see here on the inset of this map called Kubiki County. Um, and then when she was only 12, she was married to another Buddhist priest in Dewa province, which is all the way up in the north. And his temple that she married into was in the river town of Oishida, which you can also see on this map. Yep, yeah, there's Oishida right there. Um, and amazingly, that temple is still standing. Um, and the temple building is completely reconstructed, so I don't have a picture of it here. But this is the temple graveyard and the bell, and these are structures that would date to Tsuneno's time in the 1830s. So Tsuneno lived here in Oishida as a bride uh, for about 15 years, but that marriage ultimately collapsed and she was sent home. And we don't know exactly why she was sent home. I try to think about it a little bit in the book. Um, after and she was married off again by her older brother, who is now head of the family. She married twice more, divorced twice more. At that point, Suneno, who was already in her mid-30s and had been through three failed marriages, decided that she would rather die than marry again. She said, I would rather die than marry some widower in a terrible place. Instead, she pawned her clothes and she ran away to Edo, which is the big city that's now Tokyo, um, where she found work as a maidservant and lived in a back alley tenement. There in Edo, she married again, this time a man of her own choosing, a fellow migrant, a peasant from the village next to hers in Echigo, who had gone to the city to reinvent himself as a masterless samurai. And after that, she lived a very colorful life in Edo, living in poverty most of the time, before her husband got a position in service to the very famous Edo city magistrate, Toyama Kagemoto, who is better known as Toyama Kinshiro, who is the hero of many Japanese television dramas. Um, and that's a picture, not of course of the historical figure, but actually of the figure in the television drama. I once posted this on Twitter, 
um, in a thread about Toyama, and someone popped up to explain to me that, in fact, that is not a picture of the actual Toyama, <laughs> the, 18th, the 19th century figure. And I was like, yeah, I know. Um, but the reason that we know that um, she lived in his residence, which is actually the South City Magistrate's office, is because of the addresses on the letters. Um, so when her family sent her correspondence, this is uh, a letter that's to her husband, it says to Izawa um, Hanzo, and it says that he is in Toyama Kinshi, Toyama Saemon's office, um, and says where it is. And this is a letter from her, which it says the return address is um, in the city magistrate's office. After she worked in the city magistrate's office, she died um, in 1853 in the city of Edo, just weeks before Commodore Perry's black ships arrived in Edo Bay to quote unquote open Japan. Um, so that's the outline of a story, but it's really just a series of plot points and not the story itself. Um, while it can kind of mechanically show you that social and physical mobility were possible for women in the early modern period, it doesn't give you any texture and it also has no life. Um, so what I wanted in my work was to create a sense of who these people were, what their problems were, how they decided to solve those problems, and so it wasn't enough to just know the facts. Um, I needed more. So sometimes I could find more by turning to the form of the sources and not necessarily just the content. Um, so for example, here is one of the letters that Tsuneno wrote home in 1844, and this comes from her family's collection in the Niigata archives. So if you know Japanese, even if you don't know what this means, and it took me a very long time to work out what this means, you can see that she wrote mostly in the phonetic script. Um, and there, if you don't know about Japanese, that's fine, but what you should know in order to understand this is that Japanese uses a phonetic script in which characters are used for their sounds, and it also uses Chinese characters which are used primarily for their meanings. And in modern Japanese, people write in a mixture of both. In the Edo period, Tsuneno is writing primarily in the phonetic script. And in some cases, people wrote in the phonetic script because they had a lower level of education, because it takes a long time to learn how to write all of these complicated Chinese characters. And it's easier to just learn the phonetic script. But even extraordinarily well-educated women tended to write in the phonetic script because language itself was gendered. And if a woman clogged up her writing with a lot of Chinese characters, even if she knew them, it would have seemed odd, like she was showing off or like she was being extremely masculine. There are also phrases that are gendered that only women used in their writings. Um, one of them is a phrase called kashku, which she used to close out letters. So Tsuneno, I've told you, was a runaway. She got divorced a lot of times. She was unconventional in many ways, but she kept to this convention in her writing. She used the feminine form. She used the phonetic script. Now, because she was using the phonetic script, she was spelling out everything the way it sounded to her in her head. And this is important. And the way I can explain this is by um, talking about Philadelphia. My mother is a uh, first grade teacher in Philadelphia. And Philadelphia has a very distinct accent. If you've ever been there and talked to a lot of people in Philadelphia, you'll know how to hear it. Um, one of the distinctive things about the Philadelphia accent is the way that people pronounce the word saw, which sounds, I can't do it, a little more like Saul. When my mother is teaching first graders how to write in English, many of them, because they had the Philadelphia accent, wrote the word saw, S-A-W-S-O-L-L, -L, because that's how it sounded to them in their head. Sinino, who spoke with an Echigo accent, did the same thing. Um, and that became, to me, an important part of her story because, because she writes in her own accent. Because she writes, for example, for the word Edo, the city of Edo, she writes Ido, which I didn't understand for a long time because Ido means well. I could understand that she brought that accent with her to the city and that would have marked her as different. So both those things, her embrace of kind of feminine forms of writing that were very gendered, even as the content was often rebellious, and the revelation of her accent in her writing informed how I wrote about her character. 
Another example of how content, um, and oh, this is a good example of how um, Tsuneno's writing looks, right, with a lot of the phonetic script versus how her brother looks. And he's writing a lot of Chinese characters. And you can very clearly see by comparing the difference, the gender difference in letters. So that if you pick up a letter from the Edo period, you almost always know before you read it whether it's a woman's letter or whether it's a man's letter. Another example of how the content of my book was informed by the form of the sources and not just the content is my discovery of this document, which is the best document I found while researching this book. Um, so to understand why this is the best document I found, um, it's useful to know that the whole time I was writing this book, I had no idea when Sunino was born. And because I didn't know the date of her birth, I also didn't know how old she was. And because I didn't know when she was born, I also couldn't really have a good starting point for the book to say at this time, on this day, or even in 1803 or whenever it was, because I just didn't know. And this was very frustrating. So I became accustomed to the idea that I would never know this information. And I went to the Niigata archive for a final fact check. Um, and I was calling up documents that I hadn't seen before that I didn't think were relevant, just in case I might find something that would shed new light on what I had already written. And I called up this document, which is billed as a record of Tsuneno's older brother Giyu's birth. And this is what it looks like. It's the title and has the date of his birth on it, has the mother's name, Haruma. And this is what it looks like. It's a booklet with a lot of long pages. So I'm flipping through this record of Giyu's birth, which has nothing to do that interests me. Um, and it says, you know, all these presents that people brought to the house when he was born. And I'm flipping through and flipping through and taking pictures dutifully. And then I flipped again and found this page. And you can see that this page looks totally different. It's in a different hand. And it also says something different. What it says here is, Third month, 12th day, Tsuneno's birth. So finally, I knew when Tsuneno was born. And when I saw this, I actually was so moved that I turned around to look at the reference book to avoid kind of crying all over the document. Um, and what was very funny was, it wasn't just that I finally figured out when Tsuneno was born hidden in the back of this document. It was also that I'd learned to read manuscript well enough that I could read it <laughs> when I encountered it in the archive. But I still wasn't sure of myself. Maybe I'm seeing something I want to see. So I brought it up to the archivist, and I said, excuse me, excuse me, can you please confirm that this says what I think it says, which is Tsuneno Tanjo. And she says, yes, that's, that's my reading of it. She said, you really like Tsuneno, don't you? <laughs> it's kind of a massive understatement. Um, so I was really happy to discover this document. Um, but what was important about it was what the arrangement of information in this book meant. That is, Tsuneno's older brother's book birth was the important one. Uh, the record of it goes on for pages and pages, and her birth record is stuffed into the back of the book almost as an afterthought, and it's also much, much shorter, and it's written in a woman's hand rather than in a man's. And that information informed how I wrote the opening paragraphs of the first chapter of the book, which is about when the baby gifts arrived, how there had been more for her older brother, Giyu, all the things that people had brought for him, and in contrast, the baby born on the 12th day of the third month was a girl and a younger child, and her gifts were simple. So that's what the manuscript sources look like. But to conclude this lecture, I want to turn to some of the visual sources that I could use to illuminate the world around Tsunino. Um, so we can visit Echigo or we can visit Edo. Um, do people want to see Edo or do you want to see Echigo? Preferences? Edo, people want to see the big city. OK, so I'm going to fast forward here and show you. These are some maps that I used to build out um, the description of the Ishigami village, her village, which that description occurs early in the book. That information comes from manuscript maps held in the Rinsenji collection, so that when I talk about these kind of curved paths and small canals, that's where it comes from. Um, the descriptions of snow country were taken from Suzuki Bokshi's printed book, Hokuetsu Seppu which is kind of um, includes these anthropological descriptions of the tools that people used in digging out snow. And a lot of my descriptions of the snow come from the descriptions in this book. He was Tsunino's contemporary. Um, and that's a picture of me actually visiting this location. 
And I could talk about what I learned there in the Q&A if you're interested, but I'm going to fast forward through Oishida, where she did her first marriage, to the great city of Edo. So the city of Edo is wonderful for the depth of the kind of visual sources that we have about that city. What it doesn't have is a lot of manuscript sources. It doesn't have sources, a lot of sources that look like the ones I just showed you. Uh, that is related to the, in relation to the city of its size, which is about 1.2 million at the turn of the 19th century. And the reason is that the city burned a lot and also people moved a lot. So you don't get these huge manuscript collections that you often get in the countryside, but what you have to compensate is print culture and materials like these maps of Edo. One great and really well-known example um, is actually um, a painting, not a print, but a visual source, called Kidai Shoran. And this is a scroll that's held in the Museum of Asian Art in Berlin. And it depicts an Edo street scene from Nihonbashi to Imagawabashi in the heart of the city. And the great historian of Japan, Yoshida Nobuyuki, has written a book about this scroll in which he and his collaborators have determined that this is meant to be a faithful rendition of what this part of the city actually looked like in the early 1800s. And they can cross check with other sources to say, yes, the stores depicted in this scroll are the stores that were along this street. And what's amazing about this is that you can see a lot of different Edo types in this. So you can see samurai, you can see people who are vendors, you can see uh, peasants on the bridge selling uh, vegetables from the countryside. Um, and you can also see women. But you have to be careful with sources like this um, because in this scroll, which goes on and on, this is only a part of it, um, there are about 1,600 figures depicted and only 200 of them are women. And so then you have to ask yourself, is this because there aren't many women out on the streets in Edo and this is reality? Or is it because women tend to be underrepresented in artistic sources? Um, and I could never actually entirely figure that out. Um, but using this information that is encoded in this visual record, I could write descriptions, for example, of Nihonbashi Bridge. Another source that I used were playbills. So the record of Edo is so deep that if you think about one month in one year, you can find sources pegged to that month, sometimes even to that day. Um, so to find out what's going on in the Kabuki uh, world on the, at the time when Suneno lived there, in the first month of 1840, I could find playbills that were held in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston to show me what was on stage at that point, and then cross-reference those with woodblock prints, which are held in other museums, that advertise that specific performance. Now you might think, and this is how visual sources are tricky, that this is actually how that actor in that performance looked, that that was the costume and that this was a scene that was actually on stage. In fact, that is not the case. These prints were advertisements for the play, but they didn't actually depict what was being performed in the play. And in fact, this scene from this play might not even have been performed in 1840 at the, the um, Kabuki play that it was advertising. Rather, what this tells you is what people wanted to see, what was fashionable, what people were looking at in 1840 in the first month. And I use that to write a description about how kabuki actors set fashion. Um, and I say that if Tsuneno looked at the prints advertising productions in the first month of 1840, she saw the great actor Onoe Ezaburo dressed as a geisha, and I describe what it is that he's wearing, right? So I don't say this is how he appeared on stage, but I use it to illuminate what fashion was like. Finally, and this is my last example, um, some of the best sources for looking at Edo are maps. And some of them are pocket maps. So actually, Tsuneno's family in the countryside had a pocket map of Edo, which is about this big, that they could actually take around to orient themselves if they went to the city. And finding this map in their collection made me realize that actually Tsuneno's family was very interested in the city of Edo, even though they were provincial people. But there are also maps showing land ownership and value called koken that were used for determining who owned what plot of land and how much it was worth. 
And in those maps, you can often find layouts of what tenement rows and back alleys looked like. And so here where I've zoomed in, where this circle is, there's a well. There are also latrines and trash boxes. And for looking at maps like this of the tenement blocks where Tsuneno lived, I could imagine what the layouts of the back alleys looked like. And finally, maps are also interesting for illuminating how the city was imagined, um, how the people thought of this space that they inhabited. So this map over here is a big map of Edo that shows you pretty much the entire metropolis. But there are also these kind of segmented maps that are called Kiriezu, which I'll just zoom in on part of it. And these maps are you know, important for knowing what the city looked like. So when I talk about Tsuneno entering the city, I can tell you all the things that she passed by because I can trace the path of the Nakasendo through Hongo. And I talk about the red gate to the Lord of Kaga's mansion, and I can see that it's right there. But also, it's important to understand how maps um, express the way that people imagined their space. So for example, um, Tsuneno got a job at the mansion of a samurai called Matsudaira Tomosaburo. I know this because I read it in one of her letters. I had no idea who this guy was. He was not famous. Um, I also knew that, uh, that she lived in Kanda Minagawacho, which is over here. This is Kanda Minagawacho. I had no idea why it was that she was living in Kanda Minagawacho and working at Matsudaira Tomosaburo's mansion. Um, because he was just, to me, a random person that she'd gotten a job with. But actually, I could find Matsudaira Tomosaburo's mansion on the Edo Kiriezu, the segmented map, for a neighborhood called Surugadai, which is a samurai neighborhood. And I could find Kanda Minagawacho on the segmented map, a different map, uh, this one of Kanda, which is a commoner neighborhood. So these are two different maps. But the thing is, if you put these maps together, you realize that this is all the same place. And that, in fact, Minagawacho, where Tsuneno lived, the, the commoner district, is just steps away from Matsuda Daira Tomosaburo's mansion, right? So you understand then that the reason why she got a job at this mansion is because it's actually a very close walk. It's quite nearby. But the other thing this tells you is that people did not imagine these two neighborhoods as being the same place. There's the samurai neighborhood, which is in the samurai map, and the commoner neighborhood, which is in the commoner map. And that informed how I wrote about Tsuneno um, going to work at this place. It's in the book I write, every morning she went out through the tenement gate, walked the short distance into a samurai district, and entered yet another of Edo's many new worlds. Um, so that is a short introduction to some of the sources I used and how I kind of thought about them in order to build a narrative, um, and how I entered Tsuneno's world, at least in my imagination, myself. Um, and I want to end it here so that we have 15 minutes for questions, if anyone has anything they would like to ask. Uh, thank you so much. This is in incredibly fascinating. Uh, we will go until 1 PM. Uh, if you need to leave uh, for a 1 p.m. class, you're welcome to do that. Um, if you have questions, we just invite you to raise your hand. We will bring a microphone to you. We invite you to stand and introduce yourself briefly uh, and share uh, your question. If this is fascinating to you, uh, I want to make you aware that uh, uh, Professor Stanley will also be speaking tomorrow at 11 a.m. Uh, um, as part of the 2023 Dillamar Jensen Lecture on the topic of urban history as global history, a view from Edo, Japan. Uh, and that is um, tomorrow at 11 a.m. in uh, 1060 in the library, in the, in the library auditorium. Um, if you also have not yet had a chance to pick up a book of the semester and would like to read this story, Come see me after the lecture, and I can hook you up with uh, one of Amy's books, OK? So uh, again, um, we welcome your, your questions and discussion, and we'll conclude at 1. Hi, my name is Marissa. I'm a psychology major and a global women's studies minor. Um, I just finished the book yesterday, and I had a question 
maybe more specific about divorce. So she was divorced like four times. Yeah. And I feel like in, normally in history, divorce is really frowned upon and like there's a lot of shame around it. But I'm just curious to hear about what the culture was surrounding divorce then. I know I read that men have to initiate it. But yeah, is there anything you have to say about that? Yeah, that's a really good question. And it's often something that surprises people because people associate the past with being more conservative, with having certain norms about marriage and having less divorce. But in the Edo period, that is actually not true. Um, and divorce is surprisingly common. And more than half of first marriages don't make it 10 years, either because somebody dies or because there's a divorce. Um, if you're thinking about why the divorce, though, um, why is there so much divorce in the Edo period? It's because of what the family system is like. Um, so I often make this, um, make this argument with reference to my own family. So, for example, Japan has what's called a stem family system in which the, you're supposed to choose an heir, usually a son, um, sometimes a daughter if you don't have a son, but then that son is supposed to get married to a woman. This is an exclusively heteronormative system. And they are going to live with the parents. The parents are then eventually going to retire. And that newly married couple is going to take over the, head of, uh, the headship of the household and also whatever that household does. So that, for example, if you are making soy sauce, you make soy sauce. So like my husband would make soy sauce. And then my son, right, we choose one of my two sons. Uh, to carry on the family name and the family household. So we'd choose whichever one we thought was the better option to carry on the household's tradition of soy sauce brewing, its business. Um, and you sometimes choose the older one, sometimes you choose the, the younger one, it depends on their temperaments. But whichever one you choose, the other one has to leave. So in my case, right, I have Sam and Henry, Sam's older, Henry's younger. Sam is probably the better bet. So I'm going to choose Sam to take over the soy sauce business and I'm going to send Henry off to make his fortune elsewhere or to be adopted out or something. So Sam is going to have to get married to a woman, and that woman is going to have to live with us. Now, what happens if that woman is very, very bad at running a soy sauce brewery? What if we don't like her? What if she doesn't do the household tasks well? What if I can't get along with her? What if Sam can't get along with her? Then we really have a problem because the next generation is imperiled and their business might not go smoothly. So in order to keep the integrity of the household, we have to get rid of this woman, and we have to try again to find somebody more compatible. And so it's actually the kind of rigidity of the household system that creates a flexibility in the marriage system. And this is what you see over and over again, is people getting divorced and remarried until they find the best fit, not just for the couple themselves, but also the family. Um, so this is what you see is happening in Sunino's case. Um, but what's interesting about Tsuneno is that she divorces so many times. So it's not unusual to be divorced once or even twice, but once you get to three times or even four times, then people might think you're really difficult to get along with. <laughs> There's something wrong there that you can't make a marriage anywhere. And then your options start dwindling. Um, and there's also the fact that she never had a child, so it's possible that she couldn't have children and that this would have been an obstacle. But there are plenty of people who are already had children and were just looking for a woman to marry to carry on the business in the household. So that shouldn't have been so much of a problem, um, especially later on. So we don't actually know why Tsunino was divorced so many times. It must have had to do something to do with her personality. Um, but it was kind of on the outer edge of what was normal. It wasn't completely you know, out there like, we can never speak to this woman again, but it was just like a little bit iffy. Hi, my name is Meg Stratty, and I'm an English major and a women's studies minor. Um, my question is a little more specific, too. Um, so in the book, when Suneno is assaulted by her traveling companion and she doesn't really have like the words to describe it or she doesn't really understand what happened to her how would you relate that incident to her brother's first wife's assault who also she didn't like tell anyone about it ah oh, that is such a good question and i wish i'd given the other version of this lecture which is like specifically about that it shows the documents um, that her brother wrote about her his first wife and her being assaulted um so basically in chapter two, there are two different accounts of sexual assault. One is that, well, no, actually, it's chapter two and chapter three, but one is that Tsuneno runs away to Edo um, with a traveling companion, a young named, a man named Chikan, who she says is a friend to her. Um, but then her story kind of changes over time, and eventually she tells her family that when they were on the road together, he pressured her to marry him. 
Um, and he wouldn't take no for an answer and threatened to leave her alone on the road, and she had no choice but to do what he said. Um, so thinking about this in the context of the language that she had available, this to me means that he raped her. Um, and she didn't have a word for rape that we would, that kind of men would have because it's a kind of judicial word that comes up in legal cases. And her kind of framework for thinking about sex that she might not have wanted was marriage. This is a woman who had been through three arranged marriages that she did not necessarily consent to, the first of which was when she was 12. So when she says, oh, you know, my husband, oh, this man says he wants to be my husband and I couldn't refuse him, that's what she means, I think. Um, and it's also interesting that her brother earlier on, the brother who kind of is managing the household, has a first wife who he ends up sending away because she's not good for the family, so it's one of those divorces. Um, but she confesses that she has been raped, and from the kind of gaps in the source and from what he says he cannot say, um, we can assume that the rapist was Tsuneno's other brother, so a brother raped his brother's wife. Um, and she disappears from the record and is never heard from again. I wanted to put those two stories together, or at least I wanted to talk about her brother's first wife specifically because it was a way of talking about what marriage meant in that era and why it was that Tsuneno would have wanted to run away from it, why she would think, I would rather die than marry another person in a terrible place, um, to think about the kind of social conditions of patriarchy, but also to understand um, Tsuneno's brother, <laughs> which is that Tsuneno's brother becomes a really important character in the story um, because he is the one who's always telling her she, he can't, she can't do things, and he's the one who keeps all the records. And I wanted to tell that story about his wife because he ends up sending her away after she's been raped, and he ends up covering up for his younger brother, whose bad behavior caused this. But you can see in the way that he writes about it that he's tortured by it, and he says a lot of stuff that he can't say. And I wanted to kind of think about how people he would think about as having power in a patriarchal system are also really constrained by that system and end up doing things that they don't necessarily want to do. And I thought that even though his wife who's raped is a tragic figure because she disappears, she's raped, she has a child, she disappears from the record, the brother who sends her away is also in a way a tragic figure who is acting in what he thinks are the best interests of his household, even though he personally might have rather seen a different outcome. Hi, I'm Melissa. I'm a psychology major and global women's studies minor. Um, while I was reading, I felt like one of the major themes was individualism versus collectivism. And so while you were doing the research, how did you uh, differentiate between like a 21st century lens and like what she might have met, or like during this time might have met um, when she was discussing making choices for herself versus choices for the family? That's a really good question. And one of the reasons why I wrote this actually is because there are a lot of scholars of this period in Japan who would say that early modern Japanese people had no concept of the individual and that was something that was invented by Western philosophy they didn't get to until the end of the 19th century. I look at this and I think that can't possibly be true um, because Tsuneno writes about her individual desires. I want this. This is mine. That's not yours. I want to go here. You won't let me. I'm going anyway. And ways that definitely do not equate her own self with her position in the patriarchal family. She is definitely an, in an adversarial relationship um, with her brother and with the whole concept of the family. Um, and so in kind of writing about Tsuneno's individuality, or her as an individual with her own motivations and desires, which she definitely writes very clearly about, I am trying to counter that argument, which I think is actually not correct. My name is Emily Lucas. I'm a nursing major and a global women's studies minor. I was just wondering if you could expound a little bit on your experience exploring Japan and how you used your experience and perspective of, of the culture into your writing of the narrative? That's a really great question. Um, I have a lot of things to say about my experiences in Japan and how they informed how I wrote the book, but they're not necessarily all experiences of Japanese culture. They're often experiences of Japanese places, and also it's really careful, uh, how you have to be really careful with those experiences. So for example, um, 
I showed you a slide here about um, when I was in Ishigami. So I went to visit the site of Tsuneno's former village. Oh, there I am. Um, that's me there. And um, I understood a lot about this place from talking to the people who live there now. And one of them was a scholar named Asakura Yuko, who explained to me that in the winter, it's really hard to see uh, the roads because the snow blows across them and you can't see anything because they're very flat. Um, and this informed how I wrote about right, the snow blowing across the rice fields and it being impossible to find your way. So I was taking an experience from the present and saying people in the past also had this experience. However, on a different trip there with somebody who was not a local, just by myself, so I had no local uh, experience to guide me, I went to the train station in this place, and it's now a nature preserve. And I was standing in the nature preserve like, okay, like there's nothing here. I don't know what to, there's no trace of Ishigami village in this area, um, but at least I know what the natural world looked like. I know what the mountains look like. I know what the rice fields look like. I know what the summer feels like. And oh, I hear the sound of a bullfrog. And I knew it was the sound of a bullfrog because I'd gone to the um, Natural History Museum in Chicago with my children many times and pressed a little button that had a bullfrog sound. And my older son was terrified of the bullfrog. So I was like, I know this is a bullfrog. So I was like, OK, so I can say you know, that she heard the sound of bullfrogs. OK. But it turns out, actually, she could not possibly have heard the sound of bullfrogs, because when I was talking to a Japanese scholar about this, I was like, oh, you know, I heard a bullfrog. He said, oh, so you met a fellow American. And it turns out that bullfrogs are an invasive species. Um, and my friend said, oh, they came to Japan with Perry in 1853. That actually turns out not to be true. They were originally brought from the United States, from Louisiana, actually, by Japanese scientists who thought the bullfrogs would be a good source of food for the Japanese population. So you had this bullfrog breeding scheme, but then the bullfrogs escaped and they ended up all over Japan and they're like actually incredibly problematic. So that tells you, right, that like experience without context doesn't tell you anything. And you have to be very careful about what you can assume about the past from the present. Yeah, one more question. Um, I am Ali. I'm a political science major, women's studies minor. Um, I was curious, when I was reading about so when I was journey to Edo, it was heartbreaking because it felt like the whole book she was, or at the beginning of the book, she was so excited to get there, and it had been this dream of hers. And then her experience getting there was, like, so traumatic and hard, and she's in poverty until she's able to get married anyway. And so I was curious, like, how much would she have known about, like, what Edo would have been, like, for her as a woman before she got there? Like, how much was she exposed, I guess, to how big the culture shift would have been? Yeah, that's a really good question, and it's something that I try to um, think about in when I'm writing chapter one. In chapter one of the book, I try to explain the kind of the pull factor, the allure of the city. And in chapter two, I'm trying to explain the push factor, why she doesn't want to be in the countryside. Um, I think she would have learned about the city from popular culture that was available in the countryside, so news of things like plays or woodblock prints or that map that they had in their collection, right? And also, Edo was a place that her brothers had been, and her brother, her younger brother, Gisen, was there studying. Um, so it was a place that was accessible to men, the men in her family, but maybe not to the women. And I would assume that that's how she heard of this, as a place that would be desirable to go. Um, and it was probably because also Edo is very fashionable. Um, and she's somebody who's really interested in clothes, um, not just for fashion, but because she makes them. She makes them herself. Um, and so I assume that that is part of the allure of the city to her, that it is a place of fashion and fantastic clothes, and also a place that her brothers have gone that she hasn't been able to go. Thank you for participating. Thank you.